Hello everyone, thank you for joining us on this talk about uh, pupillage uh, and tenancy at One Chancery Lane. Uh, my name's Ella Davis, I am a barrister at One Chancery Lane, I've been there uh, qualified for about five years now. Uh, I'm joined today by our three most recent tenants, so Susanna, Tom and Henk, uh, who are going to talk to you a little bit about their experience of pupillage and how they got to become tenants at One Chancery Lane. They've all come from slightly different uh, through slightly different routes. So before we go any further, I'm just going to ask each of them just to introduce themselves um, and give us a little bit of information about how uh, they got to uh, becoming tenants at One Chancery Lane. So uh, Susanna, shall I kick off with you first? Yeah, sure. Um, so I did a non-law degree. Um, I did theology and oriental studies, which has absolutely no bearing on law at all. Um, I then took a year out and then I did a law conversion and I ended up doing pupillage at another set which does mostly health and safety and then I did a third six at One Chance Three Lane and that's how I ended up here. Thanks Susanna. Uh, Tom, how about you? Um, again, I did a, a non-law degree. Um, I, did, I read classics um, which is a bit more relevant to law because of all the various bits and bobs of, of, of classical language that find themselves in law, uh, but mostly irrelevant. Um, and then I went to drama school and I uh, worked as an actor, not very successfully for a few years. Um, and while I was doing that, I uh, did a law conversion and then I did pupillage with uh, the government. Um, so I worked uh, with the government legal department for 12 months and then I um, came across to the independent bar and did a third six uh, here at One Chancery Lane um, and uh, I was called in 2018 so I'm now uh, th three years called give or take. Thanks Tom and Henk. Oh uh, yeah so I, I also studied uh, politics and philosophy so not anything to do with law. Um, I worked in finance for a bit after university hated it. I then did a law conversion um, really enjoyed studying law, uh, got pupillage at one chance through Lane, and I qualified in October 2020, so I'm, I'm the most recent tenant. Great. Well, I thought um, what would be helpful is uh, maybe um, if we can perhaps give some tips for pupillage applicants um, and talk through some of the uh, things that we think about the application process. So um, the first thing I was going to ask is, do any of you have any sort of top tips for pupillage applications that you want to throw out? Oh, I've got I've got a, a couple of tips actually. Um, I think my biggest tip would be just to kind of get as broad an experience as possible, because I think you'll be surprised how you can tie in certain experiences in, into the people that interview. So, for example, I worked in sales. I worked in I was cold calling at a cold a, a call center for about three four months, which it is extremely unglamorous and it wasn't particularly fun. But trying to sell something to someone who has no idea who you are or what you're trying to sell actually does have some similarities to the core experience, as it were. And I did find that being able to talk about those sorts of experiences helped me quite a lot in interview. So I, 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 would, I would emphasize try and get as broad an experience as possible. And um, if that's not if that's non-law, that's not necessarily fatal to the merit of that experience. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I had a similar experience, not for as long, but uh, when I was at university, I signed up for our fundraising telethon, um, phoning up alumni and just asking them for donations. So that was something I used to talk about a lot at um, interviews because I could actually point to, I was able personally to raise this much money for the university through my persuasive skills. And that's a really good thing to talk about. Yeah. And um, the other thing I used to emphasize a lot was the um, amateur dramatics that I'd done when I was at school, because again, that's sort of presentational skills. Mm. Tom, I imagine you were able to make a lot of use of your drama background. Well, yes, I'd certainly tried to to get it in to say that, you know, oral advocacy was all the same as, you know, doing Hamlet. Uh, and I think in some ways that was, it, it did work, um, getting my foot through the door in various places. Um, because I think, I sort of agree with, with Hank that um, having a sort of diverse... Um, CV with with interesting things that you might have done. It could be anything. It doesn't have to be acting or sales and thing, but but something that just um, makes people want to find out a little bit more about 
that aspect of yourself um, is a really useful thing to have uh, on a pupillage application um, because pupillage committees are reading hundreds and hundreds of these things, the, these, these paper applications I'm talking about at this stage. Um, and it is just, it's a very, very difficult thing to do to try and get yourself to stand out as one in, you know, 800. Um, and, and I think all these, just these, these little interesting bits and bobs about yourself, you might not think um, a, a lawyer wants to, to read about because it might not be, you know, clerking for, for a Lord Justice in the Court of Appeal. Um, but actually, I think people whose committees really would want to, to, to hear about those little interesting nuggets about yourself, because if you were called to interview, they would want to ask you a question about that and see if you can talk your way into showing how that bit of experience, non-legal experience that you might have had in your, in your previous career or your previous life um, might be relevant to oral advocacy, written advocacy, um, client care, any of those sorts of uh, bits and bobs that make up our work as barristers. I agree. Um, and actually that sort of feeds into one of the questions that I get asked a lot by people that I mentor or people that we meet at pupillage fairs, which is how do you make an application stand out? Um, and particularly, I think people have struggled with that in the last year when it's sort of a bit harder to get some of the traditional experience like mini pupillages and pro bono and that sort of thing. Um, do any of you have any thoughts on um, the sorts of things that you should be doing to make an application stand out? Um, I mean, what I would say is that there's certain criteria you need to tick off. And what I found helpful when I applied is to think about all the things I could say and then go through them and say, this, these different things pick off these different criteria and I'm going to put them in these different boxes on the form. So I'm not repeating myself, but I've got something which covers everything. Um, in terms of standing out, um, I mean, if you if you are really interested in the set and you've researched, you know, exactly what they do and what their members are involved in, I think that makes you stand out. If you can say, oh, you know, I'm really interested in this case, which one of your silks did last year in the Supreme Court. I think that's impressive. And someone reading your form will be happy that you've you've researched it. Yeah, especially if you have actually researched it as well. The problem with that kind of thing is you have to be careful that you've read, then read the case and are able to talk about it. But I agree, if you've done that depth of research, that sort of thing is really useful. Um, anything else that you think people could be considering beyond the sort of classic mini pupillages, mooting competitions? Run your own business. Um, I did. I did a I did tutoring for about three years, um, partly part time, and I tried to make money and then I talked about running a business and I said it's a bit like being a barrister. Um, I don't know how persuaded people were but hopefully someone was persuaded. I think it's relevant. I think we forget sometimes that we effectively are running our own businesses. We get a bit caught up in doing the actual law stuff but we do <laughs> run our own individual businesses as well. Yeah. I think the other thing that um, I think is quite important is to make sure that you think about any employment experience that you have as well. Again, whether it's relevant or not, um, you know, we've got members of chambers that have had Saturday jobs doing things like working at Thorpe Park. I used to fruit pick on a farm and that sort of thing. And actually, it is useful for people to have some of those real world life skills. I know when I first started applying for people straight out of university, I wasn't that successful. And I think rightly so. I, I wasn't really ready to actually go into practicing as a barrister but took two years working at the free representation unit um, which again is something that people can consider volunteering as they want to stand out and by the end of that process I think had that confidence that ability to deal with people um, people who are going through difficult times in their life and actually be able to support them in a way that um, I maybe didn't when I was a sort of fresh-faced student straight out of university who'd never really seen anything of the world so I think I Actually, I can I, I can add on to that. I think I think one other thing that can help a CV stand out it is showing a, a long-standing commitment to a, a volunteering organisation or something like that. Instead of just doing it for one month, two months, just before the application season starts, I think that's quite transparent, and it, and it does look like a box-ticking exercise, as it were. But I think if you can show, for example, you know, a two-year commitment to this organisation where you really got quite deeply embedded in it and you were helping people and you were 
helping them solve issues, uh, I think that is something that would stand out. Um, and I think that certainly, I, I think it probably would be obvious if you were kind of going through a box ticking exercise, right, I need three many people, it is I need two months of this volunteering organisation, I need two months of this volunteering organisation. Uh, and I think maybe sometimes it, it, it might be best to just to choose one that you can really kind of throw yourself into. Uh, so I think that would be one thing that, that could potentially help, help the CV stand up. I agree. Okay, this is possibly a tricky one for you all, but uh, is there anything that you know now that you wish someone had told you, either when you were doing your paper applications or when you were doing pupillage interviews? I think probably if there's one thing I would tell applicants, it's to be ready for rejection. I know that sounds really harsh, but uh, I suspect between us, all of us on this call must have had dozens of rejections either at paper sift stage or interviews i mean i'd probably make up that number just on my own um and i think unfortunately it is a part of the process that all of us have gone through um, definitely i agree um, and it's really hard you know particularly after an interview getting told you weren't you weren't the candidate they wanted it can be difficult yeah but i think the important thing is not to be dispirited by it because unfortunately by the time you get to that stage there are just lots of good candidates um, and ultimately you are looking for that one interview that just goes your way and you do only need one. Great, okay, well I think probably, uh, unless anyone has anything else that they want to say about pupillage or pupillage applications, I might ask you all uh, a little bit about your experience of pupillage at One Chancery Lane. Um, so Henk, you obviously had the sort of full 12 month experience with us as it were, um, can you just tell us a little bit about what that's like, how it's structured, how people at One Chancery Lane works? Yeah, so um, you basically sit with three supervisors, uh, four months each, so four months per supervisor. Uh, and at least in my experience, each of my supervisors specialise in a slightly different area, um, whether that's within the spectrum of personal injury law, whether they have other niches outside of that world. Uh, and so what, what that allows is, is for you to get some exposure across the full range of Chambers work. Um, really the first seat, as it were, is really just designed to kind of warm you up and get you prepared for, for the second bit. Uh, and things do really start to, to heat up after Christmas once you're kind of preparing for your second six. At, at one chance for Lane, you, what are the assessment processes did you have to do work for the, the admissions committee you start doing that work after Christmas uh, and then come April you're, you're starting your second six you, you're in the the flow of your ICO work uh, and then come July there's a decision and it's all over very quickly actually um, but yeah that's kind of the basic structure um, and obviously for you, you had a um, slightly unfortunate experience <laughs> you know, as much as the start of your second six coincided almost exactly with the first lockdown. How was yeah. that managed in your case? Um, yeah, it was, it was very, it was, it was quite peculiar. Um, yeah, so the start of lockdown intersected almost per perfectly with the start of my second six. And there was, I, I was probably in court, I'd say, in, in in April and maybe the majority of May, maybe once a week. So I was still getting that court experience, maybe not as much as I otherwise would have had, but I was still in court one time a week. And then that slowly picked up. And by the beginning of June, middle of June, I was probably in court two or three times a week and just doing the full range of junior work. So I was doing like credit hire disputes, RTA disputes, procedure applications, things like that. Uh, and, and so I think in summary, my pupillage experience was recovered somewhat because I was still getting the court experience, luckily, and probably to the credit of the, the clerks, because I know it wasn't easy. And I know there was a drop off in court work or a massive drop off in court work when lockdown hit. Um, but no, it was definitely a weird year. I think pupillage generally is quite a weird year and, and, and COVID made it about 10 times weirder. So. <laughs> Okay, thank you. And then, um, Susanna, you obviously had a slightly different um, experience of people at One Chance Relay. What's it like for third six peoples? How does that work? 
Yeah, so um, we have one supervisor for the six month period. And I mean, in some respects, it's similar. I mean, you, there's certain things you have to do. There's assessed work, there's court work. Um, I think it's different in the sense that when you start, you already know a lot more than you do when you start a 12 month pupillage. So in a sense, you can kind of hit the ground running, um, try and avoid making any kind of rookie errors that you might have made in your 12 months. Um, and try and impress your supervisor and, and other people in chambers and um, ultimately there's the same boxes to tick off obviously um, as I said you know you'll do work for your supervisor you do work for uh, members of the tenancy committee and loads and loads of court work so it's busy um, but it's it's really really fun um, yeah anything particular Ella that you wanted me to expand yeah. on or no, I have to say though, five years in, and I think I'm still making those rookie errors. So I'm, sh I'm <laughs> sure you're not. <laughs> um, Tom, is there anything you want to add about your experience of third six pupillage? Um, well, one thing, one thing that I do think is is uh, particularly uh, excellent about One Chancery Lane, if I can blow our trumpet on this, is that the way in which we label it is not actually we don't we don't call it a third six pupillage. We call it a six month period for probationary tenancy. Um, and I think that's really important. I mean, it might, they might just look like two sides of the same coin, but we're advocates and we know that language and labeling matters. And I think um, for me, I really appreciated coming to the set, um, knowing that I was coming, as it were, as a probationary tenant, i.e., you know, presumption in my favour potentially of getting the tenancy, and this was a probationary period. I still needed to pass all the various uh, bits and bobs of assessed work that Susanna was talking about. But there was that that feeling that I I was no longer a pupil um, because the pupilage is that period prescribed by um, the regulator, and that this was now about me trying to get a tenancy, um, and I was being assessed on on, on that basis. And I, I really appreciated that labeling and I think it's a, a, a great thing that the Chambers does. Um, uh, otherwise it was slightly different for me I think to Susanna because I'd come I'd come from the employed bar as I say I was at the, at the government legal department um, so I had some experience of oral advocacy because they do a little bit um, there but by no means a, a typical second six independent bar you know, treading up and down the county courts uh, around the land kind of second six. So I had much more limited advocacy experience. So it was a bit of a baptism of fire for me coming in um, at the start of my third six and, and getting my first papers for court, etc. It did feel a bit more like a, a second six period uh, of pupillage. And uh, as Susanna says, there's a lot, there's a lot of work there, um, uh, lots of court work fitting in the paperwork in uh, around the sides. Um, and then the only other thing for me is that, that I, I, I got the tenancy at the end of it pretty much at the same time as Hank was starting his second six, i.e. at the period of, uh, of lockdown. So I've not really had that. Um, I've not had an in-chambers experience of, of actual tenancy since I've got that. So I'm very much looking forward to getting back and to, and, and establishing my tenancy in 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 chambers yes aren't we all <laughs> yeah. um i think that's a really good point that you make there about the probationary tenancy um and the expectation that is there uh, and it's worth pointing out that actually the our 12 months pupillages are similar in as much as uh, we recruit pupils very much with the expectation uh, that they will be taken on as tenants obviously they have to uh, pass their assessed work and they have to perform well in their pupillage but we don't take on, for example, pupils in competition with each other. Uh, and that was really important for me when I was doing my pupillage because I was doing my 12 months pupillage at the same time as another pupil. And we knew that there was no question of only one of us being taken for tenancy and having to fight for that spot, which meant that actually we were able to really support each other through what is, I think, there's no point sugarcoating it, quite a tough process, however supportive your supervisors and your chambers it is. Um, and it was just nice to know that we could talk to each other, that we didn't have to sort of be careful around each other. Mm. So I think that's really important. Uh, and again, it means that you do have that sort of feeling of a certain amount of belonging from the moment that you arrive. You, you can, you know that you should be expecting a future in that place as long as your work is up to scratch. 
that's, that's an important point. Thank you for raising it. I think one of the things uh, that I thought it would be useful for us to talk about as well is that process of transition from pupil to tenant, because I know that for me it was quite a daunting moment in my practice. Uh, you have to be responsible for your own practice quite quickly. You have to go to court on your own. You have to sign off your own paperwork. Um, and it's quite, it feels quite early in your career in some ways to make that transition. So I just wanted to ask you all what kind of support there is for new tenants as they make that transition from people to independent practitioner. I can you my offer. Hank, I think Hank goes first because he's most recent. <laughs> Um, well, I suppose it, first it's difficult for me to, to describe what it's like at other chambers, but I have been wildly impressed at, at the extent of the support and offer of One Chance Relaying. And really, in my experience, the support goes right the way through the organisation. So with the junior practitioners group, I know I can call any of you anytime I've got a question uh, that needs answering. and We can discuss it on the phone. And I know that fortunately, I, I, you guys will put time aside to, to have those discussions with me. Um, which makes a massive difference. I can imagine this job would be extremely stressful if you couldn't call up your colleagues and discuss over an issue that you're, you're not sure about, particularly when you're, in, you're massively inexperienced. Uh, then also senior members. I, I know I can also call up senior members if there's uh, a question that requires a bit more experience and, and else. Um, I can call them up and they'll be more than willing to help. And then the clerks as well. The clerks are always emphasising um, you know, that your, your well-being matters and, and it's important not to take on too much work and it's important you put yourself first and, and at no stage have I felt any sort of pressure in that respect to either take on more work than I'm, I feel able to do or anything like that. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say that I've been massively impressed with the, the amount of support on offer at One Chancery Lane. You mentioned our junior practitioner group. I thought I might just explain for people watching what that is. Um, so we have a group of uh, juniors in One Chance We Lane, largely up to about 10 years call, um, who form a group who do things like their own marketing events. We've run internal training on topics that are of particular interest to juniors. Um, and one of the things that I think is really good about the way we're structured is that that junior practitioner group also has a representative on Chambers board to make sure that, again, the interests of juniors are heard and are represented at a senior level. Um, so that's one of the things that I really enjoy about the way we work. Uh, at one chance we lane. Yeah. Um, Tom, did you want to add anything about the support in chambers for new tenants? Um, yes, um, and probably I'll talk about it from a from a slightly more um, lockdowny perspective because I think one thing that we've done quite well in chambers is that the old approach, I guess, the in the the, the pre twenty twenty approach. <laughs> Um, which I experienced while I was doing the, the probationary tenancy period is, is a great atmosphere of, of sort of wandering down the, the, the hallways and, and knocking on doors um, in the sense that, if, you know, you have a question um, that a member of Chambers might be able to help you with, you just go and knock on their door and everyone's very welcoming and very friendly. But of course, come 2020, that becomes a slightly harder uh, thing to do with with more remote working and even when we get I guess to the end of of the pandemic I think in some ways the way in which we all work might be might be changed towards a, a more remote version of working and I think one thing that we've done really well in chambers is creating these kind of remote methods of of uh, of support um, uh, and we have the, these uh, groups of uh, for electronic communications on on WhatsApp or Slack or other platforms are available, um, and, and it and it just makes it easy to be able to just ask questions that you would normally have done by just walking down the corridor and, and knocking on a door, but you can just just reach out to to other colleagues um, in a way that I think is is I don't know why because it's effectively the same thing, but it just it it seems to me easier. To, to write it on WhatsApp or Slack than it would to send an email. I don't know why that is, but it just feels to me a, a, an easier method of communication and, and it has helped me, I cannot tell you, immeasurably in the last, well, year since, since uh, I got uh, tenancy to, to have those really simple questions that sometimes you feel a bit silly asking, but you shouldn't feel silly asking because you, you're new to this. 
but but having those really simple questions answered that normally you'd just be able to kind of turn around to your roommate or or walk down the corridor and knock on a door to be able to do and i think we've adapted really well as a set to to kind of moving into the online sphere Susanna, anything that you want to add on that yeah i mean i think um i would agree with both Henk and Tom, and what I would really stress is that there, if you are really uncertain about a case or something, there are people you can ring if you really need to, um, and that is hugely helpful. And I've never been in a position where there's no one available to talk to, um, thanks to the clerks and, and friendly members of chambers. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've really noticed is that there is nobody who is too busy or too grand to pick up the phone if you have a question um, from the silks all the way down. Everybody has time to answer people's questions because uh, we've all been here <laughs> and we're all still learning and we all still have questions and uh, we all need that support from each other. So uh, I would echo everything that all of you said. I think we have a really supportive atmosphere. Um, well, thank you very much to the three of you for that. I think that probably covers the topics that we wanted to talk about today. Uh, but obviously, if anybody does want to know more about One Chancery Lane, about pupillage, about um, probationary tenancy at One Chancery Lane, there's lots of information on our website, uh, on our recruitment pages. Uh, if anyone would like to know more about the different backgrounds that members of chambers have, then we also have some histories on our diversity and inclusion page where people have discussed their routes to the bar. And you can also watch a video of the live open day that we held last year, which is also available on our website. So hopefully with all of that, uh, there's lots of information for you about what life and tenancy at One Chancery Lane is. But it just remains for me to thank uh, Susanna, Tom and Henk again uh, and say goodbye to you all. <laughs>